a wonderful job with the song lyrics, the backgrounds, the countdowns, the slides for the different ministries, and helping out the preachers. But we're going to sing that song again, and but this time we're, we're not going to have the church view. There's nothing wrong, and I'm not saying anything negative that we had the announcements because they're necessary. But I think because of the words of this song, you and I should be on our feet singing this song. And it's not to belittle that you were sitting down, but we're going to sing it again, but this time we're going to sing it with all of our hearts. And I know we needed to read some things and we need to catch up on some of the information that's here. But we're going to sing this song one more time. And Sister Elena, if you could put the words up there in case someone is visiting, doesn't have the words, if you have the words to that song. And we're not going to sing the entire song, just the last portion, How Great Thou Art. Would we sing that with me, please? appreciate everything that's been done in this service, but I want to move in a different dimension of the Holy Ghost right now. I'm glad for 10 of you that agreed with that. I said I want to move into a different dimension of the Holy Ghost right now. If you're with me on that, I want you to raise a hand right now, and I want you to, without abandon, I want you to just begin to worship the Lord right now. A different dimension of the Holy Ghost. Everything that's happened so far has been wonderful. It's been ordained of God. It's been planned by the Holy Ghost. But we're not going to stop at this level right now. We're going to push in the Spirit right now. There's got to come a cry from God's people. There's got to come a, 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 a yell. There's got to come an, an inward cry that comes from the heart, that comes from the belly of a person that says, God, I want more of you today. Hallelujah. If you haven't done so already, get your 10 stringed instruments and begin to clap unto the Lord with all your might. Because the Bible says, clap unto the Lord, all ye people. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Shout unto the Lord with a voice of triumph. Hallelujah. We're a triumphant people because of what happened on Calvary. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Before you are seated, first of all, on behalf of Pastor Larson 
And I know Brother Buxton did such a wonderful job of welcoming people, but I also want to welcome our visitors here on this Sunday morning. Normally our pastor and first lady would be here, but uh, they are vacationing, uh, a well-deserved vacation. They stopped in Stockton to visit his family and hers, and now they're up in Eureka visiting mainly his family, and I'm sure she calls it her family also, but his sister and brother-in-law and other people who he's related to by blood are up there, and he's preaching now, right now, at this, at this moment. Uh, he's taking the pulpit right now while we are getting ready to hear the word of the Lord. So we think about our pastor, and we welcome all of you, whether you're here in person or whether you're here on the Internet, we welcome you to the house of the Lord. For about 30 seconds, let me just remind you once again that in your bulletin is this colored sheet. If you'll get it out right now, if you don't have a bulletin, raise your hand. The ushers will help you get a bulletin. There's one over here on my left. There's a couple people here on my right. There's a gentleman in the center right there. Corey and Josie, I want you to know we prayed for your mom. We're going to continue to pray for her. We prayed for Yolanda the other night. Sister Delia was kind enough to let us be a part of that. And you have a wonderful mom. Wonderful mom. She's full of faith, and we really enjoy getting to know her. And we're going to keep praying for her. 30 days of prayer. Pastor Larson said, I want to start January out the right way, and that's with prayer. So we have some things here that we have listed. You don't have to go by numbers. It's just a list of 30 things. You can pray any way you'd like to pray. But these are some things that we are hoping that you will focus on in the next 30 days as we pray as a church. At the very bottom of this paper, there is a line that says, All Church Prayer and Fasting, Friday, January 24th at 7 p.m. That doesn't mean that you have to wait till January 24th to pray and fast. It just means that as a corporate body, we're going to dedicate that day for fasting. And we gather here at 7 o'clock that evening, and we have a special time of prayer. How many of you have ever been to one of our prayer meetings? Isn't it a blessing to be in our prayer meetings and just get together and pray to the Lord and ask God's blessing? So keep this with you. We may not publish it again. We have extra copies, but keep this with you. Put it somewhere where you can consult it during your time of prayer. Look at it. See if there's something that you want to focus on as you're praying. And, of course, if you can see there, number one, we pray for our pastor and our first lady and the ministers of the Anchor Church. We would appreciate that very much. You may be seated this morning. I'm not going to read an initial verse. Thank you, music department, Sister Ashley, for, for taking the place of Brother Chris Higginbottom. You did a great job. All of you that sang did a wonderful job. And I hope that you all had a wonderful Christmas. What do you think? Did you have a good Christmas? How many of you are wearing something new that you got for Christmas? Very good. It shows. I can see because you're beginning to smile. You're showing people your... Some of you got teeth, right? I can tell because they're nice and clean this week. Very good. All right. But we had a wonderful Christmas. I'm glad you did too. If you didn't have a good Christmas, I hope that things get better for you. Uh, I know that we're... Uh, Sister Larson posted this on her Facebook. We're, we're right in between the two holidays, those two big holidays, Christmas and New Year's. And it's kind of like a time where... For lack of a better expression, we get a little carnal sometimes, you know, because we're, we're into so many things. You know, we're into so many things. And I don't mean carnal that like, you're know, out there sinning. I'm just saying we, we sometimes lose a little bit of focus on the things of God. Uh, but I'm glad that we come to a church where we can get refocused. And we really understand that the Christ is in Christmas and that if we are going to celebrate New Year's, we don't celebrate New Year's like the world celebrates the New Year. Uh, we have a different perspective on our New Year's. Uh, how many of you have made New Year's resolutions? Well, you know what? First of all, smile at your neighbor because some of you are scaring me right now. <laughs> and if they did smile, well, you know, maybe halfway through the message, you'll check again and see, see if they have a pulse, all right? But uh, how many of you made resolutions or are going to make resolutions? I confess. All right. Would you like to hear the top 10 resolutions that are made every year? This is a list, Okay. It's been Googled, so it's Bible. It's been Googled, so it's, it's true, okay? The top 10 New Year's resolutions are as follows, starting from the first one. Spend more time with the family. Yeah, for some of us. More exercise and getting fit. 
Wow. We're going to run the aisles today in church. Don't look at your neighbor. It's you I'm talking to. The next one is lose weight. Did I say that one? All right. Give up smoking. I know a lot of people would like to give that up. It's a, it's a habit that's not good for your body. I get out of debt. All right. We're going to have revival in a little bit. Learn a new skill. Take up a new hobby. Well, that was two people. Put something back into the community by helping others. Come on. Amen. All right. Get organized. Well, I could look at some faces right now. and We do need a revival in getting organized. Become more security conscious. Isn't that amazing that we are living in a day and age where that's one of the top ten resolutions to become more security conscious? Giving up drinking is another one that people... Now, this is across America. You know, this is not a survey here in the Anchor Church. A resolution is this, as follows. It is a decision. Listen. A resolution is a decision. It's a determination. It's a resolve. It means to make a firm resolution to do something. Determining an action or a course of action. The last part of this definition says firmness of purpose. That's a dictionary version of resolution. But in this place right now, in this body of believers, in this group of people, we call each other brothers and sisters. It goes beyond those 10 things that I mentioned that were surveyed on a Google search. It goes beyond a dictionary.com definition of what a resolution is. Because if you're a Holy Ghost filled, Jesus name baptized, and trying to live for God, your resolution should encompass more than just losing weight or taking on a new habit. Because a resolution amongst the body of believers at the Anchor Church or any apostolic Pentecostal oneness group should include things like the following. That marriage and family matters should be the number one priority in our lives. That soul winning should be something that goes to the top of our list. And I'm going to say that again for those of you who turned away when I said that. For somebody to get a resolution to say, I want to win a soul in 2014. I want God to use my testimony. I want God to use me in a Bible study. I want God to use what I have to give to somebody else so they can come to the Lord. And I'm going to stop here for a second. I really, truly believe that in the midst of any church, there are groups of soul winners that God has commissioned with special word, with special talent, special graces. And sometimes they wait in the wings because they don't know perhaps the first step to take. But I'm telling you right now that if you will listen to today's message, you will understand that there are people here that need to understand that God is waiting for you to, to speak to somebody who lives in your world, who lives in your sphere of influence, and no one's going to reach that person but you. I also believe that there's a resolution that should take place amongst us for more Bible reading. I shouldn't say that unless I read the Bible. Well, I want to tell you that, you know, I'm going to toot my own horn, and I guess since I have the microphone, I can. But Sister Kateris and I last January made up our mind we would read the whole Bible. And thank God she finished a little bit after me, but we finished the entire Bible before the end of the year. I don't do that every year, but I did it this year. And I still have my Bible reading chart. You should get online. You should call somebody. You should see somebody and get a, a there's a, a website called Doing Good by Dr. Arlo Molenpaul. And he has several reading plans that you can check out. You should read the Bible. It should be a daily thing that you do. Prayer habits should be a resolution. If you're a wonderful prayer warrior, keep doing that, Sister Purnell. 
Keep praying with these ladies that you're praying with every day. Keep talking to them three times a day and getting together with them for them to pray, just like she's been doing this whole year. But begin to pray. That's one of the resolutions that we should have. As, long as, 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 as well as with physical health, as well as with money matters and things like that, because the physical health of your body and your money are tied into your spiritual testimony. But Sister Lena, would you put up that title here today? Because I'm not going to talk about our resolutions. But the title of the message I have is God's Resolutions for You and I. Because I believe that God has resolutions. And if I'm a true child of God, I'm going to want to know what those resolutions are. Because any list of resolutions, any commitments that I make, any purpose that I make inside of me, should all fun, fall underneath the umbrella of God's resolutions. So what are God's resolutions on this Sunday morning when our pastor is not here and the first lady is not here and uh, the bowlings are gone and we're missing a lot of people, but we can still have a move of God in this place, amen? And we're going to talk about God's resolutions by saying the following, that when you look at God's resolutions, God's resolutions do not change from year to year. He doesn't have a set of priorities in 2013 that he's going to change for 2014. When God sets forth a group of resolutions, when God puts forth a group of principles, Brother Pace, God sets them in stone and they don't change. For instance, if you go to the book of beginnings, which is the book of Genesis, you see that worship was instituted in Genesis chapter 22. So even in the book of beginnings, you and I are participating in something today that was instituted thousands of years ago by people that followed God. Now maybe our methods are a little bit different, and maybe our electronic instruments are a little bit different. And you know, they probably didn't have a group of, of drum players in a cage, so to speak. And I don't know why they say cages for drum players, but they call it a cage, okay? You can deal with that later, those of you who play the drums. But worship was instituted back in the book of Genesis. It is something that's a prerequisite to any follower of God. It is a resolution of God that anyone that loves him and that thinks about him as their Lord, as his Lord and Savior should be people that understand that God has a resolve, a resolution that says that we are to worship him with our whole mind, our whole heart, our whole body, and our whole strength. Somebody say amen to that. If you think that prayer is something new, you're wrong. Because in Genesis chapter 32, we see the first prayer that was made from a man to God in the book of beginnings. The word sacrifice is not a word that we use just here in this millennium. But in Genesis chapter 31, the word sacrifice was instituted way back then. God made a resolution for man to sacrifice unto him. You and I don't sacrifice the same way. We don't have a pen of sheep and animals outside. We have a pen over here, but it's not with animals. It's just representing the nativity. But we don't hear the bleeding of sheep. You don't hear the, the, the mooing of cows. And you don't hear uh, all of that sound that you would hear back in biblical days. But we do sacrifice, don't we? We do give of ourselves. The word tithe, if that gets you excited, I hope it does. But the word tithe was instituted, get this, Brother Richard, in Genesis chapter 14. Wouldn't that be so sad if I, as a person, said, you know, one of my resolutions this year in 2014 is to start tithing. Oh, that would be sorry. I better be tithing already. I better understand that God has given you know, one of our saints just fell ill. Let's raise our hands right now. Let's, let's ask God to touch Sister Bisbell. That's why you see a little bit of movement right now. Don't be alarmed by it. We have people that take care of things like that. Let's pray for Sister Bisbell right now. She had to walk out right now. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. 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 
In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. In the book of Genesis, Chapter 2, we see something that was resolved by God, a resolution that will not change. And that is the resolution of marriage. The Bible calls it a union between a man and a woman. For some people, it's becoming a tired subject that it is being spoken of by what, by what they call as the right wing of society. Some people think that a person behind a pulpit maybe should let off a little bit or let up a little bit or back off a little bit when it comes to the definition of marriage. But Genesis chapter 2 declares that it would be between, be between a man and a woman. So in Genesis chapter 2, the book of beginnings, we see God already instituting what we call marriage. Even in the new church in the book of Acts, we see that Peter, on the first chapter of the book of Acts, he referred to the Old Testament, things that had been spoken by God to men of ancient times. That these men, on the day of Pentecost, referred to. For instance, in the first chapter of the book of Acts, we see that Peter refers to David when he spoke about Judas. And that was thousands of years before it happened. Also, we see in Psalm 69 and in Psalms 109, approximately a thousand years before the birth of Christ, that Peter refers to those writings. In Acts chapter 2, we see that Peter stands up and one of the comments that he declares is that he says, This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Because when the Holy Ghost had fallen, he refers to scripture that a prophet 2,800 years ago from today had spoken in the word of God. So that new church was really based on something that had been preached or had been resolved by God thousands of years before that. In chapter 2, verse 25, he refers to David speaking of Jesus' resurrection in Psalm 16 and 110. In chapter 3 of the book of Acts, we see that a lame man is healed. And Peter stands up and preaches a message. And in the midst of that message, in verse 13, he says, The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. You notice that he goes back to the oldest one first. He says, Abraham, the one that he had made a covenant with. Isaac and Jacob. That expression, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob is used 14 times in the Word of God from Exodus all the way to the book of Acts. Also in chapter 3 of the book of Acts in verse 22, we see that Peter refers to Moses in Deuteronomy 18, and that was approximately 1,400 years before the birth of Christ. The Bible says in the second chapter of the book of Acts that in verse 37, after Peter had referred to those ancient writings, after he had preached the word and brought those ancient writings to that now moment, that the Bible says in the King James Version, it says that they were pricked in their hearts. In the New King James Version, it says they were cut to the heart. Because when you and I go back to the old things of God and bring them into the new of what we're living in now, you and I are going to be cut to the heart. God is going to use the old things that he has resolved in order to reach out to us in this day and age. That expression, cut to the heart, means this, to pierce thoroughly. It also means to agitate violently. Because when the old things of God, in an anointed fashion through a man or a woman of God, are brought forth and brought into our nowadays living, it agitates people violently. 
People are going to be stirred. People are going to be moved because what God resolved two or 3,000 years ago is just as strong in 2013 as it was the first day that it was spoken. I'm telling you that God has a resolve. You see, because when God makes a resolution in his word, he is not swayed by politics like we are today sometimes. When God makes a resolution in his word about marriage, about tithing, about worship, or any other subject, he is not influenced by the media. He doesn't say, I'm going to relent and back away from my definition of marriage in 2014 because it's not popular anymore. He is not going to be intimidated by Wall Street like we are from time to time. When we look at magazines or media and we are influenced by, by the, the strength of those particular powers, God's word is never influenced. It's never intimidated. God will never relent and he'll never water down any of his resolutions. Another part of God's resolutions in 2014 for us is that he wants an intimate relationship with us on a personal level. You see, because God does not fax, he does not tweet, he does not Facebook, and he does not Instagram. And many times we think those things are intimacy. They are convenient, and sometimes I understand that they're very necessary. But when God wants to deal with a man or a woman, you probably won't find it on Facebook, the message he wants you to get. He'll come to an individual because his resolution is to find people that are willing to meet him on a one-to-one -one basis and have an intimate relationship with him. Come on, somebody clap your hands unto the Lord. Clap your hands louder unto the Lord. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18 says the following. I want us to read it together. Isaiah 1 18. I know it's coming. I can feel it. That's right. Come now. Let's re I'm going to read it out loud and then we'll come back to it and read it. So, uh, uh, into pieces. It says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are, they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Isaiah wrote this scripture 800 years before the birth of Christ. And that message is still real right now. If your sins are hanging over your head, if you have guilt in your life because of something that you have done, the Word of God is telling us, come now. If you go back to the original language of come now, it means let's walk right now together. When it says come, it doesn't just mean come and stand here. The Lord is saying, come, let's walk together. Let's have an intimate buddy relationship. Let me grab you by the hand, you grab me by the hand, and let's walk together in this situation. And many times when we sin and we fall short of what God expects for us, we think that God is saying, go away, don't come near me, I don't want anything to do with you. But 800 years before the birth of Christ, God re had a resolution that he would tell us in this day and age that if you sin, he is saying, come. Come now. Don't come later when the devil's had a chance to beat you up and he's had an opportunity to make you feel so much guilt that you don't want to come to me. Come now while you have the opportunity. And then he says, and let us reason together. That word reason means let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. Don't hide it. Don't walk away. Don't ignore it. Get close to the, to the Lord immediately and start talking to him about it. Because if you come to him and you talk to him about it, what is the promise? 
though your sins are like scarlet. What is scarlet? It is a red color. They shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. I'd like us to raise our hand right now because I believe that God's reaching out to somebody right now. Would you help me right now, congregation? Would you say, 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 God, whoever the Holy Ghost is speaking to right now, whether it's me or somebody else, they've been putting it off, they've been talking about it but not doing it, they've been ignoring it, but they need to come now. They need to reason with the Lord and they need to get things right that haven't been right. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. 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 It was about two or three years ago that I got a phone call. I believe that my wife and I were still in youth ministry, so maybe it was three or four years ago. But through the course of our youth ministry for nine years, we met other people from other churches. And we came in contact with them, and sometimes they sought us out, not in an unethical way, they just got, got close to us. Our youth would do something with their youth, or they would come and participate with our youth. And sometimes we would just make friends with some of the young people. And a young lady called me about three or four years ago. I told my wife. My wife was sitting next to me when I got the phone call. And this young lady had left the things of God. She told me that. I knew that already. I had heard. I, I had uh, uh, seen some things that led me to understand what she was talking about. Uh, she wasn't going to church any longer. And uh, when she was talking, I didn't solicit any information. I didn't ask her for anything. Uh, but I knew, I knew right away when she called, she told me right away that she was unhappy with life. And I was surprised because everything that I saw, everything that I had heard looked like she was pretty happy where she was at. Uh, the parties and the so forth and going out and, and doing things. But when she talked to me, she said, Brother G, she says, I am so unhappy. I tried new things, and I thought that they were going to make me happy. This is what she told me. She said, I broke away from those things that I knew. And she even used this expression. She said, it's those old things that I thought were outdated and that I didn't need to follow anymore. She's telling me this. And she begins to cry, Brother Music. And she says, I want to go back to the things that I know are right. She said, she told me, if I could just feel what I felt when I was younger. If I could just be, this, this is what she told me. If I could just be in that atmosphere one more time. Where those old songs that would lift up God. Now she's starting to preach to me now. Because out of that whole conversation, I felt at first that she wanted some advice. But really what she wanted to do was just pour out her heart and say, I'm not happy with all of this new stuff that I have. And I try to console her and I try to tell her there's a way that you can do that. Just go back to the things that you had. Go back to those songs. Go back to that prayer. I looked up this song, and I got the lyrics of that song called The Old Landmark, and I want to read it to you. Would you like to listen to it? It says, I started to follow you a long, long time ago. This is a person writing it to God. We've been to the mountaintop and through the valley low. Anybody been there? Anybody been there? Somehow it seems I've lost my way. Through the cares of it all. But I remember a place. Where you spoke my name. And I listened to your call. Isn't it wonderful when you have had moments where. God just has to speak your name. Yes there are places like that. Yes there are times like that. Where all he's got to say is your name. Because you're so connected to him that he just has to whisper your name. 
The chorus goes like this, Lord, take me back to that old landmark. In other words, this person that's writing the song is saying, to those old resolutions that you made about marriage, about holiness, about separation, why is that such a bad thing to talk about nowadays? Because we think that those things are outdated. We think that those things are not state of the art anymore. We think that those things are not relevant anymore. We think that those things are not fresh anymore. Or in my time growing up, it's not a groovy thing to be like that. But it says, there I'll make a new commitment and begin a fresh start. And listen to this. I don't know who wrote this. I know the name of the person. I don't know anything about their background. But these next lines really get to me. It says, help me find my direction. Place a burden in my heart. Oh, Lord, take me back to that old landmark. Verse 2 says the following. I don't know how far I've drifted or how long it may have been. There's a hunger deep down inside of me to feel your spirit once again. And whatever the sacrifice, listen to this, my first love to restore, my soul cries out just to be renewed like never before. I want to read that chorus again. It says, Lord, take me back to the old landmark. There I'll make a new commitment and begin a fresh start. Help me find my direction. Place a burden in my heart. Oh, Lord, take me back to that old landmark. Sister Lena, would you put Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 9 through 10? It says, that which has been is what will be. That which is done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. Verse 10 says this. Is there anything of which may be said? See, this is new. It has already been in ancient times before us. And I want to go to the New Living Translation just to give it a more modern feel. Sister Elena, thank you for doing that. It says, history merely repeats itself. It has all been done before. Nothing under the sun is truly new. And sometimes we think, i got to get the newest. I've got to get the best. But I'm telling you, when God sets down a resolution, it's like a landmark that we've got to go back to. And we've got to keep visiting it over and over and over again. Verse 10 says the following. Sometimes people say, here is something new. But actually it is old. Nothing is ever truly new. Old morality is frowned upon. You have to be politically correct now, and sometimes if you're politically correct, you're going against the word of God. Don't shut me off if I'm telling you this. Excuse me for being so bold as to saying this, but if I'm the man of God behind this pulpit, don't shut me off. Listen, listen, we are living in a day and an age where as soon as a preacher steps into this mode, people begin to turn off the preacher. Because they, o- they only want to hear the new stuff. They only want to hear the fresh stuff. They only want to hear the up-to-date stuff. But I'm telling you something, that if you and I get away from the resolutions of the Word of God that were established thousands of years ago, you and I are going to be dashed on the rocks of time It may not happen today, and it may not happen tomorrow. But if you and I do not follow God's old landmark ways of the things that he made as resolutions, you and I will be dashed on the rocks of time. Because the Bible says that the wise man built his house upon a rock. And when the storms came and the winds blew, that house stood. Hallelujah. 
We're looking at a day and an age, and I'm feeling the Holy Ghost right now, where marriage has been redefined. And I know I've talked about that already, but I want to hit it again. Where people are saying that marriage is a different definition because if enough people voted in, then it has changed this definition. I want to tell you right now, there are approximately 6 billion people in the world. If 6 billion people vote to change the definition of marriage, they're still wrong. Because as long as they are going against the word of God, they are going to be wrong. Because God alone stands upon his resolutions. And he will never, ever break away from his definition of marriage. Somebody stand to your feet and declare that with me, that God's word is true. God's word is true. Can I, steep, can I keep pushing into what I'm pushing? Would you let me? Can I get enough amens in here that you're going to back up what I want to say? Fashion and modesty have taken a back seat. God's fashion and God's modesty. Don't shut me down. Don't shut me down. Fashion and modesty are redefined. Now you don't have to go too far. Or read too much into media to find out what the new modesty is. What the new fashion is. I'm not here to declare. I'm not here to measure. I'm not here to set guidelines. But in my heart of hearts, I feel that the, a Holy Ghost filled person has an awareness of what they look like when they walk out the door. I don't think, listen, I don't feel. I'm 58 years old and maybe that's not old enough to know better. But maybe I know a little bit more than some people. Just an experience. But I believe that a mirror can tell you a lot of things. And it may not say it out loud and you may not see it in script. But I think we ought to consult the mirror from time to time when we walk out the door. I'll leave that alone because I can tell I'm not real popular right now. <laughs> you see, because God's revolu resolutions are not just traditions. And they are not bound by ethnicity. They can be used in any culture. God's resolutions can be used in any time period. God's resolutions are eternal. Because the Bible says, heaven and earth shall pass away. But there's one thing that will not pass away, and that's his word will not pass away. His resolution is his word, and they will not pass away, Brother Brandon. Amen. Hebrews 11, excuse me, Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If you still love me, clap your hands. God has a resolution at Calvary to extend his love to every human being. And it was so important to Jesus Christ, to God in his word, that he didn't just begin the message there on Calvary's hill. But you can go back to the Garden of Eden when the man and the woman fell and they sinned and they disobeyed God. And when God looked at those people, he began to pronounce something over each one of them, upon the man, upon the serpent, and upon the earth. But the thing that I want to highlight right now is what he said to the woman. He told the woman that in birth, you would have pain when you gave birth to your child. But he also said that a seed would come out of you. And that that seed was going to be the one to overcome sin. Even as far back as the book of Genesis, the seed of the serpent that the Lord told the woman said, it will bruise the, your, the, your seed's heel, but the, the heel of your seed would 
stomp on its head. He was talking about Calvary. He was talking about God's finished work at Calvary. When Abraham offers Isaac at Mount Moriah, it's a prequel to what God was trying to tell us in his word, that he was going to extend a sacrifice of his only son. The Passover lamb in the book of Exodus is a prequel to Jesus Christ as the innocent lamb being sacrificed for our sins. Isaiah, which was written 800 years before the birth of Christ, in chapter 53 and verse 5, it says, But he was wounded for our transgressions. Who is it talking about? It's talking about so many centuries ago, but it is still in effect today. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. It was upon him. This man, Isaiah, was prophetically looking at that place, Calvary. He was experiencing a resolution of God when God was saying, I am going to have an answer to sin. I am going to have an answer to disease. I am going to have an answer to guilt. And it's going to be on that hill when he is led like a sheep to the slaughter, yet he will not open his mouth. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. And for those of you who have heard this so many times, please bear with me. But if there's one person here who has not heard it, I'm speaking to the one person. In 2009, I was diagnosed with cancer. This last year in 2013, in October, I was told by the doctor that I have fourth stage cancer, that the cancer has progressed into my liver and into my lymph nodes. They said, we are sending you home. That is the verse that I am standing on today. Listen. That is the resolution of God that I am going to stand on. He was bruised for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. That sounds so good. Keep doing it. That sounds so good. You're not clapping for anybody. You're not clapping for the Chargers or anybody else. It's about Jesus Christ right now. You may be seated. There's also the resolution of God of the rapture of the church. So much so that we can go back to the book of beginnings and see a man by the name of Enoch. And the Bible says that Enoch walked with God. And then what does it say? And he was no more. It gives us the condition of his testimony. It gives us the condition of his relationship. It talks about the intimacy of who he was and what he thought was important, Brother Zeke. It says, he walked with God. Now that is such an expression that, you know, walk with God, what does that mean? But if you've ever walked with God, listen, the word, the key word is if, I-F, if. If you've ever walked with God, you know if you're ready to go with God. The Bible says Enoch walked with God. And he was not. And that is telling us, showing us, that this is not going to be the first time that a person or persons that walk with God will be taken. Because it was done once before. But the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17 says this. 
Uh, please don't shut me down. Uh, you know, sometimes you can feel it, Brother Buxton. You can feel when, when you might be hitting something that, I'm not saying it's everybody, but when you feel like somebody just saying, don't talk to me, preacher, I'm talking to you. Because it says, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. Has it ever happened? No, but I know enough about the word of God that if it says it's going to happen, it's going to happen. It says, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Next verse. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the air, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. If it says it, it's going to happen. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's going to happen. And I need one more testimony. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51 and 52. It says, behold, I tell you a mystery. It's a mystery. It is a mystery. It's mysterious. It's fairy taleish. It almost sounds fictional. It almost sounds like something you'd read out of a little kid's book. It's a Star Wars thing, you know. It's way out there in the stars, you know. <laughs> but if it's in the word of the Lord, it's the true thing, I'm telling you. Because it says, behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Brother Dave, at the last trump. At the last trump, Brother Dave. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. And we shall. We shall. We shall be changed. So we've talked about God's resolutions. What if you and I in 2014 were to make resolutions that are right in line with God's resolutions? What if we got into a place with God where we just got a hold of God and said, I'm not writing any resolution down about weight, money, time with family, nothing. Until I get alone with God and get this thing really down right. They asked an evangelist one time, how do you start a revival? You want to know how he said? I'm not going to tell you his name. He had quite a few revivals. But this is what he said. You can, you can take it the way you'd like to. You can take it home with you or not. You can leave it here. He said, go home. Lock yourself in your room. Kneel down in the middle of the floor. He said, get a piece of chalk and make a circle around yourself. And say, God... Start a revival in the middle of this circle. And when that revival hits you, the revival is going to hit the rest of your world. But it's got to start here. Do you know that God has a resol resolution to start a revival in you? A lot of times we say to ourselves, hey man, we got to go to church to get revival. I don't think that's God's way. I think he spoke to Moses out of a burning bush. I don't think he sent him anywhere. I think that he went as a theophany and spoke to Abraham himself and talked to him and talked to him about, about covenant and talked to him about promises because it was in that circle. And God has a resolution for you in 2014. He wants to start a revival right in your circle. Don't look for somebody else's revival. Don't wait for somebody else's prayer time. Don't even wait for January 24th when we have our church prayer. Lock yourself up in your room and say, God, I'm going to put a circle around myself. And I'm going to make sure that the person that's inside this circle starts a revival first. 
Patrick Henry, they say he did more for American freedom than anybody because of the way that he expressed himself and the things he said. And he spoke one time in 1775, and I'm going to abbreviate and just give you the last part, probably the most famous portion of his message when he said, I know not what course others may take, but as for me, he said, give me liberty or give me death. He meant it. He meant it. He'd say, I'd rather die than to live under tyranny. And I wonder if you and I should latch on to God's resolutions today and say, I know not what others, what other course, what other, what course others may take. But as for me, give me revival in my soul. Give me revival in my church. Give me revival in my nation. Or give me death. Have you and I made up our minds to have such a resolution that we say, give me revival or give me death? It's one of two options. Would you stand to your feet? A young man, or at least when I was a young man, I got to know him a little bit, Sister Katerris, and I knew him before we were married. But in these last few years, he wrote a book, and he included something in his book, and I want to read it to you as you're standing and listening to me. Because sometimes we let things get in the way of the revival that God has resolved for us, Brother Paul. Sometimes we let things get in the way, right? Not that I'm pointing you out, I'm just saying, you know. He entitled, he entitled it this, and I don't know if he took it from some other source or if he made this up. This is what he said, Brother Music. Nothing can drag you down unless you are holding on to it. And this is what he wrote. Maybe today's the day you finally just let it go. Let go of the bitterness. Let go of the unforgiveness. Let go of the self-condemnation. Let go of the guilt. Let go of the shame. Jesus said, go and sin no more. Not stop and dwell on every negative thing, issue, and incident in your life. Jesus said, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Not stop and live in a lifetime of self-regret and condemnation. But the devil says, stop. But Jesus says, go. And the only way to go is to let go of the things and thoughts that are dragging you down. And this is my words, dragging you down so that you can't have the personal resolution revival that God wants for you. Last paragraph says, today's the day and now is the time. And that is our theme for 2014. Now is the time. Do not just be free, but be free indeed. So go and step into the dreams and destinies that God has for you. Maybe, maybe this message was just for me. But I'm tore up inside right now. I'm tore up inside. Bow your heads and close your eyes. Is there anybody else that feels that yearning to, God, to get close to God right now and say, God, redefine my, my resolutions. Don't let me prioritize the wrong things in my life. Is there anybody that come to the altar and just say, God, that's me. I want something different. 2014 has got to be something different. It's got to be on fire. It's got to be ordained of God. It's got to be written in my heart by the Holy Ghost.